Thank you, choir. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, saying, to be baptized by him, excuse me. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he was coming up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is a word of God for us, the people of God. God. It is very good to be here with each of you this morning. And as I reflected on Jesus' baptism for today, I could not help but think of the many confirmation students I have had throughout my ministry. That's a part of what I do right now. I I help mostly 13 and and 14-year-olds think through what it means to say, I believe. I believe I am a Christian, which is, of course, a very big thing to say. So many questions to ask, so many stories to hear, so much to unpack and discover and wonder. And somewhere along the way, it always happens. The question always comes, sometimes in the lesson on the sacraments, sometimes when we start exploring the life of Jesus. The question always comes, student turns her head. You can see the the wheels spinning. The hand is mildly raised and then stronger. Why, why, Why did Jesus get baptized? And when you stop and really think about it, it's a great question, isn't it? Why did Jesus get baptized? How do we understand baptism? Teachings on baptism have historically been understood as an entrance into the body of Christ. It is a communal event. But that logic doesn't make any sense here because Jesus is not just a metaphor, but actually a living, breathing person in his flesh and blood body. He does not need to be joined to himself. He is himself. And as we read the Gospel of Matthew, it seems more and more clear that there is this inextricable unity between the person of Jesus and the community of believers known as the church. Baptism has also been understood as an act of forgiveness, that it is normative, if perhaps not necessary, depending on who you ask, for salvation. And indeed, John's baptism that we see happening here was understood to be a baptism of repentance. But Christ is the agent, the mediator of our salvation. So how can it be that in his baptism in the River Jordan, that that is saving him? What sin has Jesus committed that would need to be forgiven of? And so what what seems clear to me upon reflecting on the passage, is that this baptism isn't primarily about something that's happening to Jesus as an individual. Jesus has no sins to be forgiven of. He already is the body of Christ. He cannot be metaphorically or literally joined to himself further. These are explanations that make no sense. If you know the story well enough, or if, like me, you just keep rereading it until it starts to make sense, you begin to hear the echo of something else, too. It's a story of creation from the Genesis text. 
At creation, the Holy Spirit hovers above the waters. God's very word takes darkness and chaos and turns it into something beautiful and good. Genesis describes a garden of abundance and new life, a world full of possibilities. And at the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit once again descends and hovers above the waters. God's words once again bring about new creation, new possibilities, because God has come to redeem it and make it so. And so the baptism of Jesus actually has something to do with us and who we are and who we could be. Now, I know, I know, we do this sort of thing all the time. We read scripture, we overhear a conversation at work or perhaps in the coffee hour, and, and we assume that things are always about us. Most of us, myself included, are prone to do this type of thing. That's true. But, but here, I really think it is for us. We are the ones who benefit. It's for us so that we can know fundamentally at the deepest level who we are. And it starts with learning first who Jesus is. We hear God's voice echoing from heaven, proclaiming, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Aren't those beautiful words? Do you ever wonder what God's voice might sound like? And with those words, we have learned something very important about Jesus. Up until this point, Jesus has been a pretty normal guy. He's just a guy from Galilee. But now we learn that Jesus is the Son of God. And God's Spirit somehow, I can't explain it to you, God's Spirit is somehow upon him. Jesus is the face of God for us. He is the Messiah, the one whom all of Israel has been waiting for. Through Jesus entering the waters of the Jordan, we learn his true identity as God's unconditionally beloved son. And so, in the Gospel of Matthew, God's voice tells us who Jesus is. And so my question is, what, what if God's words to Jesus were God's words to us? What if what God said about his son was what God said about you? You are my children, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. That through Jesus, we too have been given a name and an identity and a worth, a dignity as human beings that is rooted and grounded with all the saints and the eternal, unconditioned, unalterable being and love of God. What if this statement was what we fundamentally believed about one another and ourselves? Now, to be sure, I know it's not that simple. I also live in the world, and most of us at, at one time or another have really just wanted to know who we are. We want to know why we're here and what this life is supposed to be about. This is a story of identity and personhood, but it is only one story of many. There is a competition for our sense of self. A lot is at stake, and the world we live in tells us many other stories. A particularly powerful story that I'm sure many of you know goes something like this. I, I'm not really sure exactly who I am, but I do feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I'm not good enough. I need something else, something more, to feel complete. What could that something else be? Maybe it's your job. 
Maybe you have a wonderful career. You're a doctor, or a lawyer, or a professor, or you run a nonprofit that helps people in need. You do good work. People respect you. Your salary is good. You work so hard. Your work has come to define you. That is until one day you find you just can't do it anymore. You burn out or you retire. Who are you if you're not working? Who are you apart from your vocation? Or maybe you're a really good high school student. You're rocking a 4.5 GPA over here at OPRF. Honors classes are no sweat. You crushed the ACT and now you're on your way to the Ivy. Next year, you might find out that there are thousands of really smart and talented kids. And you're just one of them who all of a sudden is getting bees. Who will you be if you're not the smartest person in the room anymore? Recently, I was spending time with my junior high students at Glencoe Union Church, and I, I overheard one of them talking about the Glencoe Starter Pack. <laughs> the Glencoe Starter Pack. Curiously, I asked, what is that? One student replied with sar sarcastic glee, her eyes lit up. Oh, it's for new moms who moved to Glencoe. It's an iPhone 11 Pro, a pair of Lululemon pants, and a Range Rover. <laughs> I was sort of caught off guard by how quickly it came out, as if to say what it means to be a resident of Glencoe is to possess these items, these labels that actually might tell us who we are, that acquiring them and possessing them may be the point of our lives, or at least a life in contemporary Glencoe, according to my junior high students. Who are we without our possessions? It seems that these competing stories of identity want us to feel bad about ourselves, that somehow if we could only make this much money, or go to this great school, or have this nice thing, or live in this school district, then we can be happy. In this story, our identity is fulfilled primarily through the things that we possess. It's not very satisfying. It doesn't last very long. The newness of things wears off quicker than we would like. A startling article from the New York Times further reveals our longing for identity, how much we really just want to know. Sammy, a 13-year-old girl, posts a video on YouTube wanting to know if she is pretty or ugly. She goes on to say, and I quote, because people in my school say that I could be like the ugliest person that could ever be living. This isn't a fluke or a coincidence. There are over 20,000 videos on YouTube just like this where people are longing to know what the internet thinks of them. They just want some clarity. What do you really think of me? We all want this. We all want to know who we are. But we are not likely to find it in screens or the next big thing. Our identity is not based on who we are or how much education we have or what we have done or not done or how large our paycheck is. Thankfully, mercifully, it's based on God's love. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is what God says about Jesus. 
I am well pleased. The tense of the Greek there is timeless. It's not past or future. It's timeless. God has always been and always will be well pleased with his son. What if the same was true about you? What if we let ourselves feel that love? What if we felt that way about ourselves? I'm here to let you know in the simplest way possible that you are beloved. I'm beloved too. Our identity comes from God. We are not very good at making one up on our own in isolation. Knowing who we are as beloved changes everything. As beloved, we know that our worst mistakes don't define us forever. You are more than the worst day you've ever had. God's redemption and forgiveness are real things. Not merely ideas that we talk about, but virtues that we practice. As beloved, we know we belong to God and we belong to one another. As Christians, we believe that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even death. As beloved, we find joy in knowing that we are a part of God's new creation, not excluded by the standards of the world, but included by the unique gifts that God has given to every single one of us. As beloved, we find courage to trust and to risk and to serve and to seek peace. Those are really hard things to do. That's the meaning of our baptism. In baptism, God gives us a great gift, and it's the gift of knowing who we are as reconciled and forgiven people, people who are made new. So to answer the question, why does Jesus get baptized? Which is a really great question. Jesus gets baptized because he's showing people how to live life the way God always intended it to be. Jesus is trying to reassure us that his life is in fact our life too. We are supposed to know who we are and who we belong to. We belong to God, we belong to one another. And so today, God is asking you, us, me, to simply believe it. To let go just a little bit. To let go of our past mistakes and the things that maybe haunt us, the things that kind of circle around in your brain at night as you try to fall asleep. To stop trying so hard all the time to earn something that God has already freely given. To rest and to trust and to remember you are beloved. May these simple words be truth for you this day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
many of us have been baptized. Some as babies, some at confirmation, some as adults. For those who have been, I now invite you to reaffirm your decision or the decision made by others for you to live a baptized life, recalling the first promises made in your life of faith. Do you promise by the grace of God to be a disciple, to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, to resist oppression, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? And do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow in your faith and to be a faithful member of the church, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering God's mission in all of us. At this time, if you choose, I'm going to invite you to come forward to recall the promises of your baptism, again, made either by you or on behalf of your parents or guardians. But even if you have never been baptized, as we've discussed today, we are all beloved children of God. And so I still welcome you to come forward because simply by being, you are indeed beloved. Please come forward to the font in just a moment and uh, I will ask you to feel free to dip your fingers in and then touch your forehead and say to yourself, I am God's beloved. And then I would invite you to please take a stone as a reminder. All is ready. Please come. Here.
you, our beloved, go in peace to serve our risen Lord Jesus Christ in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.